Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be in church. It's great to be alive. It's great to be in a nation that's free where we can worship like this. Don't you agree? I, um, I, uh, anyone watching online, by the way, Ryan and Canberra and anyone else watching from around the world, welcome to our service. I wish we could have you in person, uh, but welcome anyway online from your lounge room or wherever you are. Uh, last week, we were talking about uh, what the word chuchat. Can anyone say chuchat? Can you say that with me? Chuchat, right? You've got to get the phlegm at the back of your throat and say, give it a, you know, give it a good go. And this will wake you up a little bit. It'll also help with anything that's sitting in your throat that needs to come out. So just go, can you give me a good, yeah, that's it. Now say, chuchat. That's it. <laughs> It's fun making you do things sometimes um, because we're learning the scriptures and the scriptures involve words that require explanation. And so let's not just be Aussies who say chukat, but chukat, all right? Let's learn it the way it's meant to be said and read. So last week we had a look really at five different kinds of commands that we find in the scripture. Why are we exploring these commands? We're exploring them because they're meaningful to us. You know, I like exploring commands because when Tash and I have um, discussions sometimes in our marriage, we will differentiate. Now, let's, let's say the word commands is, a, is a quite a you know, strong term, but we will work in, in measures of absolutes or whether there's leniency in something. So absolutes, Kyle will pick up all his socks from the floor. Absolute, Right. Subjective, with a little bit of leniency, is whether they go into the wash, washing immediately or whether they, you know, delay a little bit and I'll make a cup of coffee and then they get there on their own. There's some leniency here and we have differences between absolutes and ones with leniency. And, and so in everything, we have to define what are absolutes, where there's leniency, because these commands or these instructions help us define our present reality. So if I talk to you today in terms of commands helping us construct our present reality, do you feel comfortable exploring that with me? Fantastic. I'm glad. So we looked at what was a mitzvah. Can anyone tell me what a mitzvah is? What does the Hebrew word mitzvah mean? Someone said it? Command. Who said that? J A plus. High distinction. Command. It's a command of God. He says do it. And he wants us to obey, but there is a little bit of wiggle room in it to understand what it means. You're allowed to ask why. Yep, that's exactly right. The, we then have what is called mishpatim. Can anyone tell me what mishpatim or a mishpat is? Judgments. Judgments. Very well done, Andrew, on second try. <laughs> judgments. What do judgments relate to? Judgments relate to anything that requires a court of law. A woman is caught in the act of adultery, there's two, or a man, and there's two witnesses required. That is what is a judgment. It's a command that relates to a court order or court uh, ruling. The third we looked at was idot. Can anyone tell me what an idot is? Idot. Idot. Edot, testimony from Kelly right down the front. When you're reading the scriptures and it's talking about keep the Sabbath day, preserve the Sabbath day, or attend this festival, or attend that festival, or another way of saying it is of, of celebrating someone's birthday. It's a command that relates to celebrating a day. And so, so if I said to our MCs in here, we're going to celebrate someone's birthday, we're going to recognize them like we did TNT today, Teresa, TNT, the explosive duo, <laughs> Teresa and Teresa, then that has become an idot. It's a testimonial to it, and we celebrate it on a day. And finally, the last term we used last week was Torah, which relates to the overall instructions that God has given us in the first five books of the Bible. But it extends beyond just the first five books of the Bible and goes all the way through to what Jesus taught us and anything past that point. Are you with me so far? Fantastic. And by the way, Torah is not a dirty word. It's a word we love in our church. And usually there's no difference here between saying the Bible and the instructions of the Bible. We believe in the Word of God. We believe it's true. We believe, but when I say Torah, I'm defining it down generally to the instructions that God gives us for life. In fact, just this week, I had a conversation with a Muslim man. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you have had conversations with Muslims before, uh, but especially around uh, the, the land of Israel, who owns it, etc. Has anyone had that debate before? No, um, some have, and, and, you know, Palestine, it's a current hot topic, isn't it? 
Palestine, Israel, who does it belong to? And this man was throwing at me, the Bible is outdated. The Bible has been, since the third century, has been, you know, doctored and changed. And I said, well, why don't we look at the Bible before the third century? Now, that was an interesting conversation. I said, even your Quran has the Torah. It's called the Tarat. It's the Torah given to Moses for the Jewish people. And so then we started on a ground that preceded the third century. That was a cool conversation. And, and, and he, he tried to tell me, now, now I realised he wasn't a very educated Muslim in the Quran, he was cherry picking, but I like taking on a tackle sometimes, you know, a bit of a debate. It's fun. And so we took it on and I, and I, I knew one thing, is I probably knew the Torah a little better than he knew the Torah. But he probably knew the Quran a bit more than I knew the Quran. And so we agreed on one thing, and it says in the Quran, I'm not teaching about the Quran today, but I'm telling you a story. It says in the Quran that Isa, who is Jesus, is the Messiah. On that we agreed. How cool is that, by the way? And I said, where is he coming back to? And he said, he's coming back to Jerusalem. And who is he going to rule? He's going to rule the, the people of Israel and he's going to govern the nations. We had a commonality. We disagreed on parts around who owns the land, but we agreed that Jesus was the Messiah. Now that was a conversation worth having. Yeah. It was exciting. By the way, yeah, thank you. You can clap if you like. That's all right. Uh, but if you ever want to have a conversation with someone of another religion, I implore you, do some study. But when it comes to Islam, there is no doubt that Isa, who is Jesus, is recognized as the greatest prophet and the Messiah. So if you ever want to have that conversation, I encourage you, please, it's worth your time. All right, let's get into the preaching today. I believe that God has a plan for your life. But I also believe that there are things that can distract from that plan. And I aim to use the portion of this week to talk about the very things that derail us from the perfect plan or the walking that God has got for your life. God, tr trust me on this, is that when you reach a certain age, when you reach 70, God doesn't say, I'm done with you, you've done your time. For some of you, that may, may be a relief. For some of you, you might think, oh, that sounds like more work. But, you know, I, I see it all too much across the world that people reach a certain age and the world tries to tell them, you're done, you've had your time. I'm here to say that's not the case. And the same with those who are young. I, have, I come to tell you today that no matter your age, God has not got a limit on what he can do and what he can prepare and what he can plan with your life. It's not age dependent. It's God dependent. And so today I want to look at the three plans and the three people who have plans for your life. The, the title of my message today is Stick to the Plan. This is going to be about sticking to the plan. Romans 8.28, if you've got your scriptures, open there with me. Just as I was saying that, I just felt, felt a sense that someone in their head, as I said, God has got a plan for your life. You had a sense that you're done with whatever God, you've, you've experienced so much failure or disappointment that, that you don't want to even think about what God has got planned for your life. Who's that person you, you've, you've, you've faced so much disappointment this morning. God just spoke it so clearly to my mind that you don't even want to consider how God might want to work in your life because you're just disappointed all the time. Who is that person? Can I pray for you, Cynthia? Would that be all right? Come, come, come to the front. Maybe I can get Andrew just to stand. This is what the Lord, I sense, say, and it's the scripture that says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Chris, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. You have what is called, clinically according to the Bible, a sick heart. But the Lord says that he is your hope and he is your exceedingly abundant joy. This is the word I'm sensing the Lord say this morning for you both. And so I'm going to pray. Would you please pray with me, church? We pray. Wouldn't we just love to see the joy of the Lord in both of their lives? Wouldn't we love to see hope fulfilled in both of their lives today? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for Cynthia and Chris. By your Holy Spirit right now, I break whatever has tried to be on their lives that has caught hope, caught a lack of hope. And in its place, Holy Spirit, I speak hope in Jesus' name. Father, today I thank you that their hearts are receptive to receive this word and that it might be like good soil that starts to take root. And Father, out of this we see joy, we see happiness and we see fulfillment in Jesus' mighty name. Enemy, I tell you that your words have, are just lies and they have no more power. Where there's been sickness and disappointment, there is healing in Jesus' name. Father, thank you for the wonderful work you're going to do on both of these lives, for Cynthia and for Chris in Jesus' mighty name. We all said... Amen. Amen. Set your, your sights, 
Chris and Cynthia, on the Lord. Set it on him. Today I pray that there's hope in this message. All right, let's go Romans 8 to 28. <clears throat> Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love the, the Lord God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So that tells me that God has a plan, not just for your life, not just for five years, but for today. It means that the moment you came to church, your day didn't end at the end of church. It means it was just the beginning. That an integral part of every day involves the current moment, but also the future moments for the day. Because all things are going to work together for the good. Around about this time, I preached about a rabbi who's, who's, who got the nickname, This Too. Remember what we said? This too is for the glory of God. I want you to say that with me this morning. This too is for the glory of God. You get kicked in the morning by your spouse. This too is for the glory of God. Your kids drop something on your foot. This too is for the glory of God. Maybe your kids are running really slow in the morning. This too is for the glory of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Someone can say that. Maybe you're at the shops or maybe someone cuts in and blocks you off as you're trying to get a park at church or something like that. This too is for the glory of God. We need to change our language. I was talking with my dear friend Deborah this week about the power of our words. And this Saturday night, we're going to be talking about the power of the tongue. Well, we, I won't be. You ladies will be. But it's amazing the strength and power and, and conviction and change that can come to your life through the power of your word. And so when something happens, do you say, oh, shucks, this is just terrible. My life is now in the pits. Or do you say this too is for the glory of God? I tell you what, you know, because you look at the, I can see right now the people around the room that are smiling. You're all saying this too is for the glory of God. This too is for the glory of God. So it didn't, Romans 8.28 re reveals that there's a plan and that we can walk according to his purpose. And we need to discover how God identifies and keeps this purpose or this plan alive in our lives. I want you to write down, if you've got a pen or a phone, I want to write you to write down five things that I'm about to say. They're important. God has a plan for your life, but what is the plan? How do you attain it? Number one, you have to have a desire for God to lead your life. One, a desire for God to lead your life. Psalms 57 2 says, I cry out to God the Most High, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. Meaning that as you desire God, he fulfills that purpose in you. You need to desire it. Otherwise, you will be like a person who has developed bad habits and a, and, and a lack of desire for God is a bad habit. It might not look like much now, but in 30 years time, you'll have walked in a life void of the Lord. Can I tell you that 30 years ago, people used to have Saturdays and Sundays off from work. No one worked. Why? Because they honored the Sabbath. No matter which way they argued about it, whether it's Saturday or Sunday, they actually honored God's word. And slowly, people started taking their present needs over, over the word of God. Well, if I just worked an hour on Saturday or Sunday, if I just started doing a couple of hours, I remember when I was growing up, my dad said to me, you will not work on, on Saturday. It's a, it's a day that is considered holy. Well, I didn't know what that meant and I tried to work anyway. But how can I be blessed if I'm actively going against the word of the Lord? Families today who have started to just move into an online environment from COVID, who have kept that, have missing out on fellowship, small things. Small things become big things over time. So when we lack desire to do something, when we give edgeway to something, it becomes a bad habit over time. We must cry out to God who fulfills his purpose for us. Number two, we must have a love for God. And in our love for God, there must be obedience. Write this down as point number two. John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. We say that again, keep what? My commandments. Meaning that love of Jesus equates not just to our love feely uh, connection with him, but it also relates to obedience to him. And so when he says, I want you to do this, I want you to be my disciple, I want you to follow me, I want you to put down the cares of the world. We say those words, but do we really love him with a lack of obedience? I don't believe so. We need to develop an obedience to the Lord. Three, the ability to achieve the call for our life. Ability to achieve. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you both to do will and to do for his good pleasure. Meaning 
that God equips us to do this work. I'm, I'm running through these, but I'm going to come back to them. And, the, and fourth, how does he complete it? Well, unto completion, Philippians 1.6 being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. What happens at the day of Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah? Can anyone tell me? When Jesus returns on the clouds of heaven with the hosts of heaven, who gets a new body? We do. Leon does. And Leon will stand there with his six pack and he'll stand there with all of his hair down his back. Leon the lion. <laughs> and all of us will look dashing as we're in our 30-year-old bodies. Mine's a 30-year-old body. It's got a few attachments to it. It's add-ons that I need to add off, you know, subtract off. But we'll be in our 30-year-old bodies. We'll be, we'll be sharp and trim and trained. And we'll be looking great. But it's not just looking great. We will become complete. Our heart says by Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36 that it will have the commands of the Lord written on it. You will maybe put your mind towards sin, but your heart will not let you sin because the law is now written on your heart. Fifth, when in doubt and you've got questions, James 1.5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all liberally and without approach, and it will be given. So here, folks, in those five things, you've got God's plan for your life. Would anyone like me to say those five again? Fantastic. Get your pens and fingers ready. Desire that you must have a desire for God to lead your life, number one. Two, you must love God and be obedient to Him. Three, He has the ability to achieve the plan. Four, He will achieve it unto completion. Five, when in doubt, He has the answers to the questions. All right. Now let's look at player number two. Ever watched a football match that went horribly wrong? Let me put this another way. Did you watch the last State of Origin? Yeah. <laughs> went right? No, no, it went wrong. I'm preaching. Dean, come on. <clears throat> There's a number of factors why it went wrong. But sometimes one of the main reasons you see a plan go wrong is when too many chiefs and not enough... I don't know if it's appropriate to say anymore. But anyway, let's, let's say that. <laughs> cancel, cancel, car. Too many people wanting to be leader, not enough people wanting to submit and yield. And in this scenario, the three players, there's only one person really who should lead, and that is God. So the second person, the second player to enter the scene in the plan for our lives is a person called us or you. And 1 Corinthians 3.18 says, Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool so that he may become wise. So what is the encouragement from Paul in 1 Corinthians? Basically, don't get too ahead of yourself, son or daughter. Start to just put God ahead of you and trust his wisdom for your life. Anytime we take over any of the roles that I've mentioned above, we start to take back control. And I don't know if you've ever been in a car where you've been driving and someone's leaned over to take the wheel. Has that happened to anybody before? Chris, it's happened to you. Vanessa? Not surprised. No, no, I'm just joking, Vanessa. I'm, not, I'm just joking. <clears throat> it was Andrew, was it? But if you've been in a car where someone's leaned over to take the wheel, it feels a tad inappropriate, doesn't it? Yeah. Right, Leon, can you imagine, you know, if you took over the steering wheel while Beth was driving? You, you, just boy, oh boy. Boy, oh boy, Pastor Jim, what would happen if you leaned over and took the wheel from cats? It would be a disaster, yes. There would be wrath outplayed everywhere. I know if I tried to take the wheel from Tash, I'd probably, you know, smack sideways and you know, all of this kind of stuff. But this is the, and you can sense that it's inappropriate to take the wheel, right? It's inappropriate to take the wheel from Jesus as we've put him in charge of our life. We need to realize that it's not just something we can do, but it actually is inappropriate. And what Jesus will do is he'll say, no worries, mate. If you want to take the wheel, you take the wheel, but realize you're driving and it's really hard from the passenger seat. It's really hard. 
And so this is the way we treat Jesus sometimes. Now, I'm going to go through these five things again that happens when we lead our own lives. Number one, we often desire the leading for our own lives instead of giving it to Jesus. Two, we become obedient to our own ways because we know better. Has anyone thought and looked at Scripture and thought, sometimes I think I just know better than what the command's saying? I know better. I don't have to observe that. I know better. Come Saturday or Sunday, nah, I'll just work anyway. Has anyone ever done that before? Liars. <laughs> Liars. The... <laughs> Come on, yeah, another way is that people say the commands are outdated, they don't exist. And now forgive me, I didn't mean to call you liars. I, I was just speaking the truth. No, no. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is all of us have transgressed at some point the commands of God because we know better, apparently. That's one of the ways to take back the wheel. The third way is we look to our own wisdom and our own methods. That's us taking back the wheel. The fourth is we become never satisfied and we're always failing and eventually failing again. When we take back the wheel of our own lives, instead of looking to God for his ability to complete something in us, when we take the wheel, all we experience is failure. Have you tried things, living your life in your own strength and only experienced failure before? disappointment and failure that is the common road of a life without Jesus let no one tell why do famous people who have lots of money still end up committing suicide because even though they have everything they've got failure and disappointment and a, and, a, and, a, and a hole in their heart that is designed for the spirit of God to dwell and so anything attempted in our own flesh will fail and the fifth is that we've got no one to answer the questions no higher authority So when we try and take the wheel, instead of allowing the wisdom of God to be in our life, by Him taking the wheel, we then make rulings like uh, certain singers have, pop singers, uh, anybody who's been an influence has made a statement about the Scripture but totally bungled it up because they think their way is higher than God's way. I I listen to people who would call themselves Christians saying that things like homosexuality are okay in Christians. Well, friends, there's a lot more that's not okay than just homosexuality. You know, adultery is not okay. Sexual immorality is not okay. Pornography is not okay. It's not just homosexuality. And yet we have Christian leaders standing up and saying, yes, that is okay. Can you see the problem? What's happened? Take the wheel. Take in the wheel. So let's go to the Torah. Let's go to Numbers 22 verses 1 to 6 and have a little look at this. Because God has a plan for your life, but it's outplayed through the life of the Israelites. Before I go there, the third player of this game of your life is Satan. Throughout the New Testament, Satan is referred to as the tempter. He's referred to as the ruler of demons. He's referred to as the God of this age, the evil one and a roaring lion. What's Satan's strategy for your life? Is to get you to live your plan. He doesn't need to necessarily make a big plan. He just wants you to stop following God's plan for your life. Who today wants to get back on the track of God's plan for your life? All of us. All of us want to be on that plan. So let's navigate the things that take us off it. Numbers 22, 1 to 6. Numbers 22, 1 to 6. The Lord's just speaking to me right now about a person who has got a pain in the back of their knee. And it feels, the sense I get is that it's like a cramp. Who is that person this morning? It's like a cramp in the back of your leg. I think it's your right foot. Who is that person? It's like a cramp, like a tightness in the back of behind your knee, up through your hamstring. Who is that person this morning? I just sense God wants to heal your body. Who's that person? It's not David. It's not CrossFit related. <laughs> Who's got that pain? I just sense that God wants to touch it. Who's got the pain? It's come on temporarily. I don't know how much more battery it's got, Andrew. Who's the person this morning that's got the pain in the right? right, I believe it's the right. Okay, let's do this again last week.
Apparently, my orientation is a little off. Left foot, right foot, front, back. I've got to get this right. <laughs> Father, we just thank you. This one? Yes. Yeah. Father, I thank you right now by your Holy Spirit that you heal this leg. Your word tells us that by your stripes we're made well. Pain in this leg you are to go in Jesus' mighty name. Father, I thank you that anything that is connected in here that is not right, you be made right in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Healing in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We pray completeness on that. Amen. Thank you, Leon. All right, so Numbers 22, 1 to 6. Just to give you a little bit of a background on what we're going to explore here today is we're looking at God's plan for your life. God has a plan for the people of Israel, and we're exploring as they're coming into the land of Israel what's about to happen. In terms of a plan for their life, His plan is that they would go and inhabit the land of Israel. But they face some opposition. Let's read together in 22 verses 1. Then the people of Israel set out and camped in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan at Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was in great dread of the people because there were many. Moab had overcome the fear of the people. And Moab said to the leaders, elders of Midian, This horde will now come lick up all that is around us as the ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, the son of Zippor, who was the king of Moab at the time, sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor at, Na- at Pethor, which is near the river in the land of the pe- that the people of Amor. He said, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth and they're dwelling opposite me. Come now and curse these people, for since they are too mighty for me, perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them from the land, for I know that him who you bless is blessed and him who you curse is cursed. So let's break this down a little bit. We have King Balak of the Moabites. Does anybody know who the Moabites are? Moabites are the the descendants of Lot. Lot was the nephew of Abraham. And so these people were given instruction, or the people of Israel were given instruction by God not to touch the Moabites. Why? Because God had promised the land of Ar to Lot. He'd given it to him as a, as a, as a possession. And so the people of God were nearly there in the land of Israel, but to get there, they had to cross through some neighboring countries. They had just come to Sihon and Og. Last year I preached on this. These were two incredible military armies. Og was a giant. There were stories written about, written about this guy that you could write like probably R-rated movies about. It, 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 the, the, the rabbis would write about the fierceness of Og and the things that he did, and it wasn't good. And so the people of Israel came with incredible fear as they approached Sihon and Og, but they came with the word of God saying, you will take the land. And so they defeated Sihon and Og, But the Moabites, who they had been instructed not to touch, became afraid. Because if Sihon had been destroyed, if Og had been destroyed, then surely Moab was next. So what does King Balak do? He says, well, we're not going to defeat them on sheer numbers. Military numbers aren't going to work. These people are blessed by God. This is how the world looks at you. They look at you when you're following the ways of God and they say, we're not going to beat them just in sheer numbers. We have to try something else. We have to curse them. And so Balak employs the help of a prophet named Balaam. Balaam was a Gentile prophet who was a contemporary of Moses. And he was known to be a very accurate prophet. He was just very ungodly. Uh, Can the two mix? Yes, they can. You've surely seen people who prophesy and live totally ungodly lives. Have you ever seen that before? You've seen people who can preach and live ungodly lives. Surely you've seen that before. The truth of the matter is God is God and He still speaks to people. And people can present incredible authority, but not always in the Spirit of God. And so Balaam comes at response to Balak and he, he hired him so that he could get the occult and supernatural assistance to assure his way out of being destroyed by the Israelite people. He hired Balaam to curse the people of God to prevent the plan. 
And so when you've got the plan of God on your life and you're walking in that plan, let me tell you the first way that the enemy is going to use something to try and distract you is through the occult or something supernatural. He's going to try and bring something into your house. He's going to bring something to distract you from following the words of God. That's what he will do. He will introduce you to a friend. The friend will be into, into something that is not right. It could be a movie. It could be, a, you know, I'll tell you more about that in a moment. But we need to know that the first way the enemy will attack you, if not by numbers, because you're following the voice of the Lord, is through the supernatural. So God's plan can quickly become undermined when we take our eyes off Him and, and on the things of the flesh. How do we remain focused on God? Stay in the Word. I'm glad you asked and thank you, Helen, for answering. Let's look at what happens to Balaam as he starts to come with a curse for the people of God. Numbers 22, 23 says this. Numbers 22, 23. God's anger was kindled as Balaam went. Balaam was the prophet. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way of his adversary. So an angel of the Lord has come to block Balaam from, from cursing the people of Israel. It's nice to know that you've got the kingdom of heaven on your side when the enemy comes. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with the drawn sword in his hand and the donkey turned aside out of the road and went into the field and Balaam struck the donkey to turn her into the road. It's nice of you, Balaam. Thank you for striking the donkey. Verse 31, it says, Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword at hand. What an incredible story this would be if you saw the angel of the Lord. And he bowed down and fell on his face and the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your, struck your donkey these three times? Isn't it interesting that the first care that the angel of the Lord gave was towards the donkey? Don't hit your animals. Loose link. Behold, I have come out to oppose you because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside before me three times. If she had not turned aside, surely now would I have not killed you and let her live? Then Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned for I did not know that you stood on the road against me. Now, therefore, if it is evil in your sight, I will turn back. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men, but speak out only the words that I tell you. And so Balaam went on to Balak. So here we have an angel of the Lord standing in the way of Balaam, who's about to prophesy curse upon curse onto the people of the Lord who have a plan that's yet to be fulfilled. And yet because Balaam's eyes were opened, the thing that was meant to destroy the people of Israel has now been turned into a tool for blessing. This is what happens when you keep your eyes fixed on God. If your eyes are fixed on God, then the instruments for destruction will actually become instruments of blessing. You need to know this. You take your eyes off God and the instruments of, of cursing will become still cursing. And so Balaam was offered considerable money to curse the people of God. Money was his temptation. But here's the thing. Balaam then blesses Israel three times and prophesies the destruction of the nations that were around seven times in total. How amazing is that? I'm not going, in, going to go into those blessings. But what, friends, we need to do like Balaam is open our eyes to the spiritual. You and I have the ability to ask the Holy Spirit to keep us aware of His Spirit so we remain aware at all times. Sometimes the things that have led me down the wrong path have been when I haven't been aware of the Spirit of God. I'll tell you quickly about that. Um, I, used, I once asked the Lord if He could open my eyes. I read this story about Balaam and I said, well, Lord, can you open my eyes? I want to see things too. And so one night I woke up after asking the Lord that he'd open my eyes and I came out to my sister's bedroom in our house and outside of my sister's bedroom at night was this black, dark figure. And I thought someone was in our house. I thought someone was right there. And so what's your first response when someone's in your house? I don't know what yours is, but mine was to punch that thing. And so I launched in punched and got nothing but air. And I realized that that dark presence, that thing, that dark shape was still in, my, in front of my sister's door. And I realized I'm not dealing with flesh, I'm dealing with spirit. And so I said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to get out of this house. The thing left. When you ask for your eyes to be open, it isn't always the good stuff you see. The second time was I was asleep in bed and I woke up to just this bizarre feeling and sense. 
And I looked above me in my bed and I could see this dream catcher. Have you all seen a dream catcher, like an Indian dream catcher? And around it, spinning in above my head, this is not a physical thing, but it was a, I could see it very clearly, were these little shrunken heads and lots of teeth, like bits of teeth. You ever wanted to know where your wisdom teeth went? They ended up on my dream catcher somehow. And as I'm looking up, guess what I did? What would you do? I punched out at it. Boom. Nope. Went through midair. Nothing. It's in the name of Jesus, get out. I realize now, second time happening, that there's a trend. I was responding with my flesh. This was spiritual. What was the connection? I'd asked the Lord to open my eyes. Third time something happened, I felt a weight on my bed at nighttime. Notice this was happening at nighttime. And as I woke up, I realized there was someone sitting on my bed. I knew it wasn't mum or dad, and it was a figure that was dressed in white. And I looked at this person, and he looked at me and smiled, this person sitting on my bed. And I knew immediately that this was not of God. Sometimes the enemy will dress as a person of light to try and confuse you, but there was something evil about this person. Have you ever known when you get a check about someone or something that's not right? This was not a being of God. And so I said, in the name of Jesus, get out of my room. And the thing vanished. This time I'd responded correctly. Dean actually gave me a word and I went to Mozambique after this. I've, I've preached about that before. But Dean said, the Lord's teaching you to respond with your spirit first and not your flesh. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dean. <laughs> Problem was, after I received that word, I responded with my flesh again. Darn it. The point here, friends, is that you have to ask the Lord to open your eyes and so that you become aware of what the Spirit is doing. But as He opens your eyes, you need to be prepared for what you might see, both good, bad, ugly, and different. Because God's hope for you is that you would start to see the things of the spiritual, recognize them, and take authority over them. This is how the plan excels for your life. You know that the devil has now no power to curse you, friends. He's got no power to curse you. The only power he has is for you to curse yourself. And so to end this story, and I'm going to miss out two-thirds of my message again, but to end this story, Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Balaam didn't defeat, and Balak didn't defeat the people of Israel through bringing the occult or the supernatural. How did he defeat them? He defeated them. What was that, Julia? He blessed them. But how were the people of Israel defeated? good Helen how were they defeated through sin if you can't bring something against the people of God if, if the enemy can't cause you in any way then sin is the way that you'll be snared Satan's strategy for, for you to mess up your life happens in three ways first John two sixteen says for all that is in the world the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the father but of this world how they were defeated was sexual lust God had given the commands to the people of Israel not to marry outside of Israel, and yet they found themselves sexually involved marrying the Moabite women and the Midianite women. If you can't beat them, join them, join them, then beat them. That's what the enemy was doing. He invited them to dinner. See, sometimes the way of the enemy is not so overt. He invites you to dinner to entice you. And he says, come on, just have a meal with me. Come on. It's just a movie. It's got a little bit of sex in it. Come on, it's just, it's just a little bit of swearing. Come on, it's not theft. It's just downloading some songs. They, they probably would have been available anyway. Come on, I just want you to try this. Just try this thing. Just, just. Sometimes he just invites you to dinner and, says, and then traps you. The second is the lust of the eyes, which is covetousness, greed, ambition, materialism. And the third is the boastful pride of life, selfishness and haughtiness striving and abusing power, misusing people and relationships. These are the three ways that the enemy wants to derail your life. And pardon me, they start small. Have you ever read that book, Atomic Habits? Has anyone read that book before? It's a book that defines how habits are developed in your life. And I'll end on this. Good habits start not through complete change, but start through identifying something small that you're going to do daily or weekly. Bad habits form in the same way. I invite the musicians to come. Bad habits, not spending time with God, giving way to the enemy to have dinner at your house, 
they start small, but over time they develop into something big. The plan that God has got for your life involves you sticking to this narrow course, the five things that we talked about earlier. So can I get a show of hands this morning? Who wants to live according to that plan? Who would just keep their hand up and say that the enemy at some point or you has derailed you from that plan? Most of us have been derailed at some point. Would you join me and stand up please this morning? Jude 1 verses 11 says this, Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. Jude gives a lot of packed punch words in there and gives three specific names. Cain, Balaam, and Korah. Why Cain, why Balaam, and why Korah? And why are those three types of people destined for hell, according to Jude? One, Cain killed his brother, lied to God, became a fugitive, a wanderer, and he took his hand and put it on the wheel and drove it all day long. Balaam's error was he cursed those who God had called blessed. Who was God called blessed? What was that? Sorry, Jen. The Jewish people? Israel? He's called the Jewish people blessed, but who else is he called blessed? Those who are grafted in through a faith in Jesus, the Messiah, into our faith. So we do not curse the Christians either. And finally, Korah rebelled against the commands of God and the authority of God. Three people. Cain transgressed the commands. Balaam cursed who God had blessed. And Korah rebelled against the authority of God. Let's not be like those three. The command that Jude's giving, the word that Jude's giving is very clear. In Mozambique, if you've ever dealt with people uh, in Mozambique or other countries around the world on missions before, one of the most common things you'll hear when you give an altar call is the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. I cheated on my wife. The devil made me do it. Hurt my child. The devil made me do it. Has anyone ever heard that before? Mm, The devil made me do it. Funny how the devil becomes a great scapegoat for one's own sin. James tells us that we're drawn away by the desires of our own flesh. But friends, the hope we have is that Jesus comes and he says, if you put your hope in me, I will take away those sins and I'll create in you a new heart, a new person. Today, friends, I want to give an appeal for anyone who doesn't yet know that Jesus Jesus says that he stands at the door to your heart and he knocks for anyone that who would receive him. If the enemy wants dinner, then Jesus wants a feast. The enemy wants to entice you, but Jesus wants a feast that will go on and on and on. And he wants to stay at your house with you. And friends, the word tells us that whoever believes on the name of Jesus, whoever calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. In other words, the first step to the plan being right is calling on the name of Jesus and seeing Him as the Saviour, the Messiah, the one who's got the plan to prosper your life. The reason that's important is otherwise your your life just leads to failure after failure, exhaustion after exhaustion. And if anyone's feeling that today, then I want to say, restore your hope in Jesus as the Messiah because He's the one who can do it. Friends, with every head bowed and every eye closed, Jesus is the one who navigates the wheel or the steering wheel of the car to your life. If there's anyone today and you feel like you've taken a hold of that steering wheel, you've grabbed control, you've taken it, you're leading your own life, I believe the Lord wants to set you on a path where He's driving the car. I'd love it if you could raise your hand today. If that's you, if you've taken control of your own life, I'd love to pray for you. Just across the building today, if you have, if you've in any way taken control, you've experienced failure and your leading of your own life is leading you to failure after failure, raise your hand today because I'd love to pray for you. Thank you. Is there anyone else this morning? Equally, is there anyone this morning who, as I've been talking about Jesus the Messiah, you would like to get to know Him and also call Him Messiah. Is there anyone else this morning who would like to know this Jesus and have a faith in Him? If that's you this morning, would you also raise your hand? Ah, 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, I'd love it if you'd pray with me this morning. We're going to pray a prayer of yieldedness to the Lord. Can you join with me and follow after me? This is not, the prayer itself doesn't have anything to change. It's you believing it in your heart. I know all of us have said today and we've committed to wanting to yield to the plan that Jesus has for us. So Father God, pray with me, please. Father God, today I yield my life. I relinquish control over the steering wheel. I relinquish control over the steering wheel. And I invite you, Jesus, I invite you, Jesus to take control. To take control. Develop the habits in me. To develop the habits in me. That ensure that you stay in control. Ensure that you stay in control. And that my trust is completely in you. And that my trust is completely in you. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. And we all said, Amen. Amen. Amen.